Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. People who truly believe in God, these individuals are optimistic. We believe that God will act and deliver his people. We believe that God is faithful to his promises. And therefore, even though there is an enemy, and oftentimes that enemy, that opponent, is greater than us physically, but we rely upon the verse that the one who is in us is greater than the one in the world. Well, when we look at Israel in the book of Isaiah and the chapter that we're studying, chapter 22, we see that they did not have that, that quality that faith manifests. And what is that? Endurance, perseverance, believing that with God there is going to be victory. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to that 22nd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Now, in this chapter, we saw something. We saw that the people, there was an enemy coming, and they, although they took some physical actions, they did not turn to God. They did not repent from their sin. They did not cry out with an expectation that this God who is merciful, gracious, forgiving, that he would respond. In fact, what did they say? Well, as we concluded with last week, the people said, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. They didn't have a hope. They weren't believing in a victorious God. What about you? Do you believe that after this life there is a future? That future is either going to be spent in the kingdom of God or ultimately and eternally in that lake that burns with fire and sulfur. No place in between. But if you are part of God's covenant people, I'm speaking here, a new covenant faith, then you can be assured of victory. You're going to persevere. You're going to endure. You're going to believe that God will move and he will deliver. But even if he does not, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said those same things, but even if he did not, they were still going to be faithful to God. Well, in this time of Isaiah, The people weren't thinking about God's faithfulness, and therefore they were not behaving in faith, and they had no expectations. Remember that as we pick up our study this evening. Look with me, if you would, to where we left off in verse 15. Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 15. Thus said. Now I realize almost Every English translation says, says, but it's in the past, in the Hebrew perfect, which means thus the Lord God of hosts, he said. And the reason why I emphasize that is because this verse speaks about something that's yet to happen in Isaiah's days. There's even some prophetic prophecy in in this section for us meaning prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled that which is in the future the last days although much of it has been fulfilled in the days of isaiah but here's the important truth god is saying something he's speaking as though this has already happened because god has said it and what god has said 
it will be. Once more. Thus said the Lord God of hosts, you go to the steward, this steward, and the one that we're speaking about, this one who is the type of manager, his name is, it says, concerning Shevna. And Shevna, he was over the house. Now, most people believe that he was over the king's house. Others say that he was the treasurer for the, the temple. But putting either interpretations on the table, we know something. He was a man of influence. He had great authority. He was in the inner circles. He was a close confidant of the king. He was trusted by him. And secondly, if he was indeed the treasure of the temple, he had the purse strings. So he had great authority during this time. He knew, in other words, what was going on. But here's the problem. He only looked at things from a physical standpoint. And that is not a wise perspective. If you only make decisions, if you only behave based upon what, what you see, your vantage point, then you are not seeing truth. We need to be dependent upon God's revelation, Him giving us His perspective. Look now to, to verse 16. He says, What to you hear and who to you hear? Now, what this, these two idioms meaning is, what are you doing here and who are you in the midst of what's going on? The prophet speaking for God wants this man, this important man, the steward over great, great resources, whether it's the king's house or the temple or perhaps even both. The steward had responsibility. And he wanted to ask him, the prophet for God, who are you here? And, and what are you doing here? Because he, notice what it says, because you have, have hewed out for yourself here a tomb. Hewing out. And then the next word is exalted, raised up. And it's speaking about his tomb. For you have chiseled in the rock, Mishkan, that is a dwelling place, and in this context, it's probably a different word for a tomb. You have chiseled in the rock a tomb for, for him. Now, this is, what, this is what the prophet's saying. You've given up. You don't believe that there's any hope. And the reason why is because you only look at things through a physical, physical lens. You see the enemy. The enemy is more powerful physically than the children of Judah, that nation that, that you are part of, and therefore you have lost all hope. You have given up. And what are you doing? You're concerned about a human legacy. Now, many people, those who are thinking in the flesh, they want a large tomb. They make a monument to themselves. But, but the man of God, the woman of God, the least thing that we're concerned with is our tomb. Where we're buried, what it looks like, who cares? Why? Because for us, the real us, will never enter into that tomb. Because the scripture makes it very clear for a believer, when we die, our soul is immediately present with our Messiah. We will be with him. The only thing that that tomb is good for is to put the, the dead body. That's not us. That's just the shell of who we were. And now our soul being redeemed by the blood of Messiah through that gospel message to die is a release from this body of sin. 
to go and to be with the Lord. But when you don't have that type of faith, when you don't believe in the redemptive power of God, if you don't believe in the spiritual dimension, if everything you work for, everything that you hope for is in this world, then one of the last things that you're going to do is make a monument to yourself so that you have, you leave a legacy, a remembrance for you in this world. That is not how a person of faith behaves. Verse 17, behold. Now, this is always a word of grabbing attention, revealing something that's significant. God is moving against this man, this one called Shebna. And it says here in verse 17, Behold, the Lord is going to cast you, move you. And this moving is going to be quite a powerful moving on this man. Secondly, it speaks of about him being, being wrapped up. Now, the point here is that there's going to be a change of location for this man. He thought, like most of the ones without faith, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. I have this wonderful, beautiful burial chamber for myself. It's going to endure for generations after me. People will see it and they'll think, who was this Shevna? What was so special about him that he had such an exalted tomb? See, that's how the world thinks. They're, they're interested in a legacy, an earthly legacy. But we, we are moved, motivated. Our interest is in an heritage. Now, when I say heritage, that word comes from the word inheritance. And it has to do with us inheriting from God, which means that our heritage is to be part of his family. That's what motivates me, to be part of the family of God. And in doing so, I want to be an obedient son. I want to bring honor and glory to my heavenly father. But you see, this man, Shepna, he had a different perspective. And therefore, God is saying, I'm going to move you, old man. You're going to be wrapped up. And the, the imagery here is wrapped up and sent away. Look now to verse 18. Now, the word that appears here, is the same word, it's nephet, for a turban. And you all know what a turban is. It has to do with something that is wrapped upon the head. And this is the image here, that he's going to be wrapped up. It's a, a synonym for how verse 17 ended. He's going to be wrapped up. And here, most of the rabbinical scholars say that he's going to be surrounded like a, a turban is wrapped up. And something else that comes into play here is a kadur. A kadur is a ball. Now, we have a ball that's full of, full of air, but that's not their type of ball. It was wrapped up, meaning something was wrapped up and being wrapped up like a, a snowball, wrapped up. Therefore, it's a ball. But it's not going to move up. It is going to go to the land a wide land, and this is all an image of, of exile. That he is going to go into exile, and there he will die. And there, God says, your, your chariots of honor, the chariots that you thought honored you, they are going to be a shame to your father's house, to your master's, literally your master's, house meaning instead of being a faithful servant to his his lords those over him those that he was supposed to serve well what happens in the end he becomes 
shameful, an instrument of shame upon those that he was supposed to serve. Verse 19. And this is a word for being driven. God says, I will drive you from, and most scholars translate this word office. And it's like a post. It means a pillar, a place of authority where he was. So we'll translate it that way. I will drive you from your office and from, the next word is mamad, your status. Another word for a, a post. He's not going to remain in his office. He's not going to have that status, that, that place anymore for, it says, he, the word laharos, is to destroy. It says, he, referring to God, he will re destroy you. So this man, who is so focused upon the earthly, a prideful man that wanted to exalt himself, and in doing so, he brought shame to those that he was supposed to serve. What happens to him? He is going to go into exile, and there he's going to die, never to be heard from again. A very sad ending for this man that had opportunity. He was in an important place and could have made a difference. He could have been a godly influence. He could have showed a godly testimony, but he did not. He used all of this for himself. And the end result was shame and dishonor and destruction. Now, verse 20. Verse 20, it says, it comes about or will come about Beyom Hahu, on that day. Hopefully, you know that this is an expression of judgment. And judgment produces a change. So Judah is going to find judgment, but there's going to be a change. Now, in the end, what we find here is God is faithful. He is going to bring about a change in administration. Behold, we saw that earlier on. Now he says, and it shall come about in that day, I will call to my servant. Now, many of the Christian scholars see this, this one that we're going to mention, Eliakim, as kind of a, a typology for Messiah. And certainly in these last verses of, of chapter 22, there are, and remember I said there is prophetic relevancy in this passage for the last days. When we look at what happens here, we see that there was an apparent defeat coming. The people were so sure of that, they said, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. But death didn't come. There was a transition. And in that same way, it's going to look rather hopeless for the children of, of Jacob, the Israelis in the last days. But for a remnant. For who? Bet David. Now, we're going to pause for a moment because we need to remember what we talked about when we were in Isaiah chapter 7 several months ago. There's that expression, Bet David, the house of David. And that is not speaking about literally those that were biologically related to David, but those by faith believed in that covenant that God made with David of a redeemer, of a coming future king that would sit upon the throne of David and establish the kingdom of God in this world. And that is going to come about through a transition, just like we saw that there was a change from this one called Shebna to now the one made by the name Eliakim. Verse 20, once more. And it shall come about on that day, I will call to my servant to Eliakim, the son of Hilkiyahu, and all names are important. 
The name here, Eliakim, is my God, he will raise up. And the point here, it's a reference to the God of resurrection. That's what that name means. And then you have Chilkiyahu. This is a portion, the portion of the Lord. And what it's saying here is that through the resurrection, we receive our portion from the Lord. The reward, the, the outcome of our faithfulness. And this is what men like Shevna and others that said, let us drink and eat for tomorrow we die. They had no expectation of God's reward. They weren't believing in a resurrection. You don't believe in a resurrection, you won't have a kingdom faith, a kingdom hope. Everything for you will be rested in this world. A foolish perspective. It's only when we have a kingdom perspective are we going to endure, we're going to persevere, because we know that in the end, there's going to be a marvelous change. Verse 20. And it shall come about on that day, I will call to my servant, to Eliakim, the son of Hilkiahu. And what is God going to do? Well, he's going to, and this shows a change, a change in garment, a change in everything. Verse 21. And I will close him. Now, it's still being spoken to, this wicked one, Shevna. He says here, I will close him in your tunic, in your sash. I will, will gird him. And this is a word for, for strength as well. So I'm going to put your tunic upon him, and I'm going to strengthen him by means of your sash. And your government I will, will give into his hands. So this one is going to rule. Now, many see, as I said, Eliakim, him being a typology for Messiah. And the last few verses, what we're studying now in this, this 22nd chapter, as I said, has prophetic significance. Verse 21, I will clothe him in your tunic, and your sash I will strengthen him, and your government I will put into his hand, and he shall become a father for the inhabitant of Jerusalem. By the way, that is singular, the inhabitant, but it speaks about all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But the point here, he's going to be like an individual father. Father, provider. Father, protector. Father, there's an estate. There's an inheritance coming. So this Eliakim, he teaches us much about what Messiah is going to bring about for his covenant people. Once more. And it shall be, this one shall be, for a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Verse 22. Verse 22 is a verse that also finds its way into Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, and hopefully you'll know that chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation are those seven messages to the seven congregations in exile in Asia Minor. And these seven messages are spoken to the people of God in order that they might understand how to be found faithful in the last days. And notice we find here verse 22, and I will give the keys, key of the house of David upon his shoulder, meaning he is going to be responsible for the house of David. And he will open and no one will close. And he will close and no one will open. 
Now, to understand this, let's go to Revelation chapter 3 for a moment. This is a very important uh, letter. It's the epistle to the, the congregation at Philadelphia. And notice what it says here, Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading in, in verse, verse uh, Revelation chapter 3. I want to begin reading in verse 7 where it says, To the angel, this can be messenger, of the congregation at Philadelphia, write, These things say the Holy One and the True One. Who to him, and here you have that citation, whom to him is the key of David, the one who opens, there's no one to shut, and who closes, and no one can open up. It speaks about his authority. Now, the one who ultimately does that is Messiah. And that's why we can be assured that Eliakim is indeed a typology for Messiah. But there's also another well-known scripture to this congregation in Philadelphia in regard to the last days. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 10. Now, many people read this incorrectly. They arrive at a wrong conclusion. It simply says... And because you have kept my command and you have withstood in, in patience, you have made your stand in patience. Also, I will keep you from the hour of, of trial in the future that's coming upon the world. Now, what we need to remember here is how this ends in order to test the dwellers of the earth. Now, in the scripture, there is a humongous difference between Yoshev, Yerushalayim, the inhabitant of Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, I've said this in our study of this book, there's two types of people. Those who dwell in the heavens, those who dwell upon the earth in this world. And it has nothing, nothing to do where they are physically located. It has to do with their citizenship, whether they belong to the kingdom of God or whether they belong to the kingdom of this world. And what God says is this. He says, for those who keep my charge, do my work, what is that? To believe in the one whom God sent. So those who have taken hold of the gospel, God will keep them from the hour of trial that is coming upon this world. And, and this hour of trial is designated for who? Those who belong to this world. So it's a promise, a wonderful promise that we have. This isn't designated for believers. The question is, when is this time of trial, this time of, 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 of testing? Well, it's all accompanies, accompanies the wrath of God. Those who have already proven they don't need to be there, God will remove them. So when we go back to, be very careful, when we go back to Isaiah chapter 22, when he says, I will give him the key of the house of David upon his shoulder, it will be under his authority. He will open by means of the gospel, and no one will close. No one can keep a gospel believer out. And he will close those who reject it, and no one can open up for that one who rejects the gospel. And who ultimately is that? The one that God will raise, and the implication is raise from the dead. That's what Eliakim means. God, he will raise. My God, he will raise. And what we learned here is that this is something that, that we can be assured of. Look at verse 23. 
and I will fasten him as a peg in a faithful place. And it shall be for, he shall be for a throne, a glorious throne for the house of his father. Now, this is speaking, and we need to understand this in two, two ways. We have the way that relates to the time period that Isaiah was in. That the nation of Judah was not going to be brought to a destruction. A transition of leadership was going to happen. And we find here that that there was going to be a new one, Eliakim, that took over and he was going to be placed in a secure place. And he was going to endure and bring honor. But then look at what happens later on. Verse verse 24. And they will place upon him. Who's that? Most scholars believe. B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. They will place upon him all the glory of his father's house. Meaning he can be trusted. The sons and the daughters. Now, many people translate this as offspring and the future offspring. Rashi says sons and daughters, the offsprings, that generation and the next generations. And notice that he's going to be reliable. Every small vessel he's going to look out for, he's going to take care of. Every vessel of, and it's a word for a a, uh, cup, So every home utensil and unto every, and most people believe that this has to do with a, some say picture, it's a synonym for a cup and a picture, but the real way to translate this has to do with a musical instrument. And it says basically that he's going to be be dependable to keep the house and to keep music which is associated with worship everything's going to be maintained but then we have look now to our last verse verse 25 now this seems a problematic verse if you look at most commentators they rip it from the direction it's going it they take it back to shivna and say it speaks about him It kind of summarizes what took place with him, how he fell. Well, I don't believe that's at all of what it's speaking about. I believe that it's futuristic. What it tells us is that that Judaism is going to secure, it's going to endure. That, That the people, the covenant people, they are going to be kept by God, but in the future, What's going to happen? Look at verse 25. Be'yom ha'hu, on that day, judgment. On that day, he says, declares the Lord of hosts, that peg, that which you could, could put your head upon, security, that peg is going to be removed. That one that was stuck or fastened in a faithful place, in a secure place. It will be chopped down and it will fall. And the burden that that was upon it shall be cut. What it's saying here is this. Those who trusted in Judaism, all of that is going to be removed. They're going to see that which they thought It's all going to be ripped apart. And then it says, notice, for the Lord, he has spoken. And what this is foreshadowing is a time of change where the people are going to say what we trusted in, what we believed. All of that is no more. There's no security in that. And what are they going to have to do? Look, in that same way that there was a replacement for Shevna, there's going to be a replacement for the leaders of the covenant people. And who is that leader going to be? 
the sky is going to open up. Messiah is going to deliver the remnant of Israel. He is going to be the one that comes in this time of transition. Whenever we see that phrase, Be'yom Ha'hu, realize judgment is coming, but judgment can also be seen for the covenant people as deliverance. In the same way that Eliakim foreshadowed Messiah, this change that this chapter speaks of in the last verse, it also foreshadows a last day when in the same way that Shevna was removed, torn down, and replaced, Messiah's coming to replace the faith of the people, that they are going to trust in him, this one who literally has the key of the house of David. And through him, he'll open up and they'll enter. And those who reject him, he'll close and no one else can get in. This foreshadows what God's going to do in the last days. Well, we're out of time until next week. May God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.